You've got mail. This is Andy and John Talk Telecom with Andy Netzel and John Rewi. You're logged into Andy and John Talk Telecom. I am Andy Netzel, and with me, as always, is John Rewi. John, it is Halloween, October 31st, 2020. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. It is a beautiful day in Austin, Texas. And, uh, you know, Halloween on a Saturday, uh, sometimes creep up on you, you know? If it's in the middle of the week, you kind of, it's on your radar, and there's like, uh, you know, people having parties and stuff, and it's like, oh, wait, Saturday. Oh, it's Halloween. So, <laughs> See, I, yeah, I got I, no plans. What about you? I mean, you're you doing the big Halloween party? You got No, a no. I mean, we're being, uh, um, you know, COVID conscience and social distancing, but, <clears throat> excuse me, no Halloween party. Um, even though like, you know, is that a COVID cough? It is not. It is not. It is a, <laughs> uh, it is a dry throat. Need some water cough. And, um, yeah, you know, Halloween on a Saturday should be great. Um, great potential for, you know, going out and parties and everyone having a great time. But with, uh, with 2020 upon us and all the difficulties that this year has, uh, you know, sprung on us, uh, I think, uh, I think Halloween this year is uh, is not going to be as great or as fun as it as it could be. But I'll have the light Hopefully. on. I'll be handing out some candy, uh, socially distance. I've got a I've got a nice long uh, wooden pole with a basket on the end that I'm going to put the candy in. So I'll be at least six feet away from all these you know little kids with their you know snotty noses and snotty faces. And uh, yeah, I'll be handing out candy that way. So so you be, have a plan. You I've got a, a plan. Uh... You've pivoted uh, to a pandemic-friendly uh, uh, candy dispensing method. Absolutely, adapt and overcome. You know, you could just leave the candy out front and maybe leave a note or watch them on the on the um, on the, the Nest doorbell camera. But all it takes Please is one take punk to only come two up and pieces of candy from the bucket. Yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and I think most children would do that, but it just takes one punk. It's probably some like fifteen-year-old who shouldn't even be trick or treating to just come and swipe all the candy and. And ruin it for all the, uh, all the little princesses and Jedi knights and whatever kids dress up as these days. Yeah, who knows? Well, I guess we'll just have to wait a little until uh, things get less pandemic-y for uh, getting back to real Halloween. But uh, that's all right. It'll be okay. Halloween comes every year, so there'll be another one next year. It will be okay. So a lot of news this week in uh, in in our industry in telecom. Uh, is your head still spinning from it all? Yeah, a little bit, and I also got distracted because a cat just ran up the tree outside my window here. I better and, call the uh, fire department. Yeah, it's kind of that situation. I did haven't really even seen cats around here lately, so that was kind of a surprise. <laughs> not your cat, not your problem. Nope, exactly. So, yeah, lots of news this week, and uh, really over the since our last podcast, and I didn't even know really where to start. I was sending myself articles all week long, but um, you know, with my background in uh, cable TV. Uh, especially in this industry, I thought it was interesting that a lot of the Q3 results, uh, Q3 reports came out, um, and there's some pretty well, interesting data in there. So I was kind of. Would thought, you like to get into them? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's if you don't do mind. it. Each each bell's a new story. So John, let's let's get into it. And John, before we uh, start getting our new stories, uh, I'd be remiss if we did not um, tell our listeners. But in this episode, we have an interview with uh, Matt Bonnie of Charter Communications. Um, so give that a listen. Uh, talk about a lot of a lot of good stuff. His how he came up in the uh, cable world. Talk about fiber splicing, um, some technical stuff. Talk about fly fishing. Um, so yeah, it was a great interview with Matt. So uh, give yeah, it a listen. Yeah, pretty excited for that. Yeah, I think y'all are gonna like that. Matt's been uh, on the board for SCTE in Austin with me for some time, and uh, it's been really active in the cable TV community and kind of a young gun, you know. Um, so he is definitely some good stuff coming from Matt. Glad to have him on. It was good. So give that a listen. And now we will get on to the news stories. So, um, Q3 results are in for the big MSOs. Uh, we'll talk about Charter, Comcast, and LTC USA. Um, Charter's Q3 total residential and SMB internet customers increased by 537,000. 
in Q3 compared to 380,000 during 2019's Q3. And over the last 12 months, they have a total internet ads of 2.3 million, or 8.8%, which is pretty significant. You know, I, there's been a growth trend, obviously, uh, during the pandemic uh, in mm-hmm. communications, and Charters was pretty fantastic as well. They also had uh, some pretty exciting news on their mobile side. Uh, they added 363,000 mobile lines in Q3 compared to 276 thousand during last year's q3 so definitely an uptick in uh mobile customers with spectrum mobile and um uh, it's a, a kind of a continuing story and we'll see this as well with uh with the other mso's um the the big thing about the mobile growth for spectrum was that um they put them over 2 million uh subscriber let's see past 2.06 million subscribers of their mobile service. So it's pushing it a lot closer to being a profitable business. You know, um, rolling out mobile has been a costly endeavor uh, for all of the providers, but um, it looks like it's heading in the right direction. Uh, Looking at Comcast, they posted their uh, best broadband quarterly quarterly results in history, adding 633,000 residential and business customers in Q3. Who was that? Um, Over Comcast. Comcast in Q3 2020? Yeah. And one of those was best me. ever. Best yeah. ever. Well, I'm glad I can contribute to that. Well, I'm sure they thank you very much. Yeah. Um, every single one makes a difference. Over the past nine months, Comcast has added more broadband subscribers than it did in all of 2019. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Big numbers. And Xfinity Mobile. Are you an Xfinity Mobile customer? I am not. Well, look, if you were, you would be uh, one of. Uh, let's see, 187,000 that they added in Q3. So not quite as steep of a growth uh, no. curve as a spectrum, but still pretty solid. Um, but still gains. You know, they're still, still, still gains. gains. They're up to 2.58 million mobile lines in service. Okay. And if you look at uh, Altis. Give me those Altis numbers, John. Well, let's start with uh, the news with uh, Altis's, uh uh acquisition mm-hmm. mindset you know back in september they were trying to buy coach co and yeah, I, do remember, uh, I do recall they that. were rebuffed pretty strongly and they uh let's see a couple weeks ago up to their bid to 8.4 million or billion and yet again were shot down um the, basically the goal for altice was to um like coach co actually owns atlantic broadband which is a pretty pretty major provider on the eastern seaboard of the u.s so altice wanted to buy kojiko and keep atlantic broadband and then sell kojiko to rogers mm-hmm. uh and keep rogers american biggest... america and canon canon yeah and uh well to be fair uh altice oh, is uh yeah. french too Sorry, so altice uh, usa that's yeah it's very uh international uh scenario here so anyway um yeah, so there's a family that owns 69% of Coach Co., and they yet again said, not interested. So it looks like the acquisition uh, bid is falling flat, but nonetheless, they had a pretty decent Q3. Um, they added 18,000 wireless customers, so they're up to uh, 126,000. So, you know, far behind, you know, the big dogs, but still, you know, that's a big thing for them. And interestingly, I did not realize this, but um, Altice's mobile unit runs off of uh, Sprint legacy network okay. uh, for their MVNO and they are going to be transitioning that over to the new T-Mobile network in the near future. So that actually probably is a good move because T-Mobile uh, seems to be doing some really good things with their network and uh, with the combination of Sprint and T-Mobile's uh, network, um, they're really sitting in a good space uh, from a wireless standpoint. Uh, Wall Street seems pretty happy with what Altis is doing. Their stock's doing pretty good. Uh, analysts are saying it's a, it's a good one. So yeah, um, overall, uh, good Q3 results as expected, and especially for uh, Charter. You kind of to kind of talk more about the mobile thing. Uh, I think that that's going to be a bigger story over time um, as these providers um, push their mobile business. I've seen a lot more. You know, it's just um, circumstantial evidence. I've seen a lot more uh, push uh, in my area in a spectrum market uh, for them to try to get me to jump on a spectrum mobile and 
you know, I think it's going to become a bigger story. Like I said, until now, the providers have and still are taking losses to build up these mobile uh, business units. But the revenue is starting to catch up with the expenses and uh, definitely the growth trend is good. So to kind of look at some numbers uh, for Charter, as an example, in Q3, their mobile revenue totaled 368 million um, and the expenses were 456 million. So, you know, there's a delta there of uh, about 100 million bucks, but um you know they're the trend is is in a good direction and uh they are said by analysts to be ahead of of uh projections for reaching profitability so that's gonna be some big news and you talk about the convergence of networks um where uh you know mso's get into 5g and obviously they're doing that with through the carriers with mvnos but the uh carriers are also getting into home internet with fixed wireless uh, access so really interesting to see uh sort of the overlap of the two different technologies and where that's going to take us because i think that mobile provided by traditional cable companies is here to stay and something that will be a, a recurring story more and more as we go forward well that is uh that is certainly something we will watch All right, John, uh, we talk a lot about uh, SpaceX's Starlink, and apparently I am the, like you you had mentioned off air, the the resident, um, the podcast resident space expert, so. Uh, yeah, I think it's fitting, given your uh, uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, my proximity to NASA. Yeah, your proximity to NASA. Well, uh, I, I will, I will, I'm more than happy to cover anything space-based, so. But Starlink, we, we mentioned, you know, a few episodes back they're going to start their beta uh, this fall. They've opened up their beta and they've got some, some pricing uh, to go with that. Um, so for Starlink and their satellite based internet, uh, it, you're going to be paying around $99 a month for speeds of up to 150 megabits per second. Uh, however, uh, first the name, this is, this is a very Elon Musk thing. The name of the, uh, the program is the, the better than nothing beta program. So this is for, uh, for very those, auspicious. Yeah, what it, it, it screams to me is it's for all those rural folks like when you used to live out in Marble Falls who really don't have a better option. So it's like, hey, you know, I know this might be pricey and it might not be great and you lose service sometimes, but it's better than nothing. Um, so that's the bar pretty low. It does but, you know, it's, it's, it's good under promise and over deliver, right? That's what you got to do. That, that's, that's how I try to live my life. <laughs> so you're going to be paying $99 per month. Uh, however, the, you also have a one-time purchase fee of $499, um, and that's the purchase and install an antenna to connect the satellites as well as, well as a Wi-Fi router. Um, also, Starlink warned customers that there will be brief periods of no connectivity at all, um, as you know, kind of expected with, uh, one, a beta program. You know, It's not fully fleshed out and still going through growing pains, and two, a satellite-based service, uh, much like when a storm rolls through, uh, direct TV or dish network might go out. The same thing will probably happen here with uh, with Starlink's better than nothing beta program. Uh, so $499 up front for the equipment, $99 a month for the service. Um, and yeah, so they're 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 going to uh, um, try to to target those rural areas. Uh, it's also reported that Starlink agreed to supply internet connections to a few dozen Texas families in a rural school district starting early next year. So we had talked uh, before about um, Starlink only being able to cover the Northern United States and Southern Canada, but it appears now that they, uh, they have extended their, um, extended their coverage. So yeah, I mean, $99 a month might seem pricey. However, uh, someone from SpaceX in 2019 said, is anybody paying less than 80 bucks a month for crappy service? Nope, that's why we're gonna be successful. However, I would like to counter that, that I was paying less than $80 a month for my internet service, and it was pretty fast. So I'm not sure where Starlink and SpaceX get their uh, get their competitive info from, but they uh, they might want to relook that. Well, yeah, if they talk about anywhere, um, but if you just talk about rural areas, yeah, in Austin, I pay sure. $49.99 a month for 200 megs, and uh, yeah, I can expand that up to 960 meg if i want to uh which i probably would it's just that i'm used to getting about 20 megs at best um so for 99 dollars a month so um yeah 200 is doing fine for me for half that price so yeah out in the rural area i think people are used to spending that they're probably not as much used to spending 500 bucks up front to get uh an antenna and everything but 
Yes, yeah, but you just got to factor out. those costs into into the long term, depending on how long you're going to keep it for and, and factor all that in. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, this would have been great if they had done this five years ago. I just think there's a lot more upcoming competition in rural areas with um, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund with fixed internet or fixed wireless. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but um, there's now the FCC is establishing a 5G fund for rural America. Uh, so there's just a lot more competition for Starlink. but I'm sure they know what they're doing, and uh, more competition is always better. Faux oh, show. All right, John, and uh, as as we had mentioned slightly earlier, um, the FCC is establishing a 5G fund for rural America, and this is uh, straight from, from the release. Uh, it will distribute up to $9 billion for next-generation wireless broadband connectivity in rural America to close the digital divide. So we've, uh, we've talked extensively about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, trying to close the digital divide between urban and rural America and uh, um, you know, up to 20-ish billion dollars. Now the FCC and the government are pumping even more money, another nine, up to $9 billion for 5G for rural America. And- um, Well, that's good news. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good what's news. What's the criteria um, for this one? I don't know if there, I haven't seen any criteria yet, but phase one of the 5G fund will target up to $8 billion of support nationwide to areas lacking unsubsidized 4G LTE or 5G mobile broadband with $680 million specifically set aside for bidders offering to serve tribal lands. To determine eligible areas, the auction will use granular, precise mobile broadband coverage data developed in the digital opportunity data collection proceeding, allowing the commission to more effectively target funding uh, to areas of the country where support is most needed, while ensuring support is spent as effectively as possible. Phase two, obviously, nine billion minus eight billion is at least one billion dollars left for phase two. Uh, along with any unawarded funds from phase one, will specifically target the deployment of technology innovative five G networks that facilitate precision agriculture. So, phase one, eight billion dollars going out to rural America, with six hundred eighty million of that eight billion specifically going towards um, tribal lands. And then phase two will be at least a billion dollars, and that's going towards uh, precision agriculture, which is something that you've talked about in the past with Land Lakes um, and John Deere and I think some other companies, John. That's right. Well, I'm sure they'll be excited about that. You know, what strikes me every time we talk about one of these new rural broadband initiatives is just the, the number of them and which uh, federal agency is putting this out there. So we've got the Rural Development Opportunity Fund. We've got this one. We've got U- USDA funds out there. You know, at some point I wonder, can we just roll this all together into one cohesive plan? Uh, I mean, that's a dumb question because it's the federal government we're talking about. But still, doesn't it seem a little bit funny that there's about 5 million different ways that we're putting rural development or money out there for 5G or connectivity or whatever? It, it does. It is frustrating. Like, say there's an area and I'm just going to pick, I don't know, um, you know, Maine or, you know, pick your city, Nebraska, right? Let's say it's a rural area and, you know, it is covered by the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Someone auctioned or someone bid on it and they're going to, you know, cool. They have a plan to build out to the city um, from RDOF, but there's also farming, you know, in there. So someone else, another provider gets money from USDA grants to build out there. And now, a, a, you know, now let's say T-Mobile or another provider is getting 5G money to to uh, um, to build out there, and yes, competition is good. But do they really need three different? You know, this small town with 250 people. Do they really need three different providers? One providing 5G, one providing fixed wireless, and maybe another one also providing. You know, a, 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 you know, maybe they they built out from the major city. You know, they built coax all the way out there. But you know, it, like you said, there's just no cohesive plan. But hey, you know, there's a lot of you know billions of dollars going into this so that can can never be a bad thing and never not a bad thing for the people in our industry yeah exactly i mean i think that the idea is that um these different federal funds uh the eligibility uh, factors in whether it is underserved or whether other government money has been put into that area or not so they're trying to make sure that we're not you know the government isn't funding competing entities in the same area but yeah, they're also basing a lot of this off of um data like you mentioned in the story uh granular data showing you know coverage areas and things like that there's a lot of questions surrounding the accuracy of that and the reporting uh 
of truly what is underserved and what is considered served. You know, we're operating off of a 25 down, three up is considered broadband. And uh, old standards are like 10 down and one up. And, you know, what is considered a not underserved area might actually be kind of underserved. So, yeah. you know, but uh, hey, I guess you know what? We'll... Just keep throwing money at it. Something good ought to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, one thing to differentiate, differ. One thing to mention, since I can't say that word, um, you know, this is a 5G fund. So I, I know I, a lot of times I think 5G to the home. Um, so where RDOF is maybe giving internet, you know, and broadband connectivity to the home, this is just 5G in general, more for cellular carriers. And, um, you know, ne- yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be 5G to the home, just 5G uh, coverage in general. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's it's not apples and oranges. It's like Granny Smith apples and uh, Mount Fuji apples, you know. It's it's mm-hmm. it's not or gala apples or gala apples, whatever honey crisp, whatever your favorite apple might be. Um, it's not, they're not completely different things, but you know they're they're at least a little bit different. And it's funny you mentioned the um, the benchmarks of twenty five three and then the old one of you know ten down one up. Do you want to take a guess at what the uh, the benchmark for this five G uh, fund is? Um, two hundred down. No oh, man, I wish it's thirty five down and three up. So it's just funny that like oh. for our DAF, you know, it, it's 25-3, but then for this 5G fund, it's 35-3. It's like, just, just, can we just, can we just it's have 5G. one standard? I know, I, yeah. I, again, I understand 5G is different than, you know, it could be different than a way you deploy fixed, um, fixed wireless or, mm. um, you know, broadband in general, but uh, just. 5G is supposed to give us multi-gigabit speeds and we're going to still set the bar at 35-3. 35-3. They didn't even raise the upload speed. Wow. That seems quite arbitrary. That seems arbitrary. Did lawmakers just make that up or did some uh, experts make that up or did lobbyists? Someone at the FCC. Um, So, you know, maybe some lobbyists, maybe one of the commissioner of the FCC. Who knows? Hey, and I I don't mean to, you know, uh, question. I'm ignorant of how they make these decisions, but they do seem a bit arbitrary from an outsider's perspective. Perhaps we should uh, invite the uh, FCC chair on to... uh, (laughs) kind of discuss if, that if, if we get the fcc chair on our podcast then I, I will set aside an entire week to uh to get ready for that and to do that and that'll be great so we'll work on that no promises there right under you're you're over promising and there's no, a I'm not of under delivering yeah i shouldn't shouldn't be setting that uh possibility out there for our listeners but uh hey you never know you never know but with the, that said let's uh the downloads let's... are increasing so you know yeah, 25 to 35 is uh, a minor increase, but it is an increase, like you said. You know, maybe one day we'll get to uh, 100 up, 20 or 100 down, 25 up, which is what I think the, the minimum should be. But they they fail to call and ask me, John. Why do they keep? They should. they should. They should. They should call you. But let's get into uh, that's enough for news. Um, just quickly covering that, I am sure we will have more for you on all of this. Uh, in the uh, in the coming months, but let's get into our interview with uh, Matt Bonney, and uh, let's go. Here we go. All right, and we're back. Andy and John talk telecom here with Matt Bonney of Charter Communications. Matt, how are you doing this morning? Doing great. Glad Good. to be well, here. Hey, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, appreciate you taking the time um, to. Uh, talk with us on uh, on some things going on in telecom. Uh, so, how's uh, how has your um, COVID experience been, and uh, and what you're doing over there at Charter? Um, it's been it hasn't been bad. I mean, it's it's for the most part business as usual. Uh, we're on you know rotations where we're working in the office for two weeks uh, on an A B rotation. So uh, I'll be back in the office come Monday for the next two weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean for the most part it's been business as usual. We're not we're uh it doesn't seem we don't, we haven't seemed to be impacted too heavily as far as uh you know standard operations go and y'all got a lot going on right now right with uh, uh node segmentations are really all that i hear about from charter lately and then just all kinds of other network stuff so in your role in uh, network engineering how does how does that kind of play into charters like network response to covid demands well I'm on the enterprise side, so I don't see the uh, I don't see the node segmentations as much. But mm-hmm. we, you know, we talk to we deal with 
OSP and ISP a lot and they, you know, that's a big thing for them. So mm -hmm. we do, we do know what's going on. Um, as far as, as far as everything else, I mean, like I said, it's been business as usual. We're, we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of people working from home. So we've got, uh, you know, a lot of challenges with, uh, just maintenance in the, in the network and making sure that, you know, we're able to support the, you know, the uptick in, in data flow, you know? Mm hmm. What about, um, so on the enterprise side, um, you know, I think we talked about the other day about hub collapses and that being a thing. So kind of how does that tie into what you guys are doing and from a, responding to enterprise demands? Well, we're, it's a, it's a, what we're doing is we're, we're taking hub sites that are uh, either at capacity or, um, you know, expensive leases, stuff like that. And we're, 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 building these 40 channel DWDM solutions to go back to a, uh, usually a master head end, for example, but, um, it's, a uh, it's a big challenge dealing with, you know, it, we're, we're, my position itself is sort of like a liaison between uh, the engineering side and OSP and ISP. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of head butting and, and, nobody's on the same page so it's, it's it's definitely challenging yeah well i mean a lot of those or operations are have been siloed you know that's just kind of the way that organizations tend to work you know is yeah isp osp it's totally different cultures and different mandates but it's all got to work together because you know yeah. if you talk about uh dwdms out in the field well you've got to have a corresponding thing happening in the in the isp side right and a lot right of coordination with that and with yeah. uh, design too, I guess, and mm -hmm. all yeah. that's got to work together. Yeah, and it's it's interesting working. Uh, you know, we we have we have three guys on our team, and and we all kind of have our own areas. I I work n northeast side of the country, so Wisconsin, New York, uh, you know, Maine, Vermont, all the way to northern Ohio, and then Minnesota, and uh, the southeast has got you know Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky southern ohio and then west is pretty much everything west of texas so um so, seeing seeing how everybody all the different markets do things differently also so from you know going from the northeast to the west you get a completely different uh response in your requests <laughs> from from different departments and that's tough you know so it's, it's kind of nice that we kind of keep to our own areas but there is some there is some uh you know dipping in the other markets that we have to do on occasion. So I hear it's that's, it's a, it's a large uh, air responsibility from, yeah. from all the way from Wisconsin and New York and then down halfway down the country. I'm sure you didn't, didn't start there. How did you uh, tell us where'd you get your start in cable? I I've only been yeah. in cable for a few years. I know John's been in it for, for a couple, almost a couple decades now. I know that sounds pretty terrible. But, <laughs> that makes me sound quite old. Uh, I know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> where, where, uh, where, where'd you get your start, Matt? So I started in 2008 as a, uh, I, you know, got hired as an install tech. I had zero experience. Everything before that was, you know, basically minimum wage jobs that uh, mostly pertain to the auto industry. Um, but I had a, my mom had a, a family friend that was, uh, he worked for Time Warner Cable and it, he was in IT. And he, he just kind of mentioned, he said, yeah, they're, they're always hiring for install techs and it pays, you know, pays okay. So I applied three months later after interviewing, they called me and offered me the job. So, you know, in that three months, I kind of figured that I didn't get it and I was moving on to other things, <laughs> but, uh, they called and I accepted the position and, um, you know, right out of the bat, I was, it was, it was, uh, a lot of work. I was 19 years old spry and, you know, we worked from, uh, about 7 AM until midnight, one, 2 AM six days a week wow wow so <laughs> being Were you a contractor or did you work directly for time warner i worked directly for time warner i was in-house i think that's probably one of the things like the long hours and and dealing with dirty houses and weird human interactions with customers probably one of the reasons why you know a lot of people don't make it past that yeah. installer stage so what was it that made you keep on charging forward oh, in the industry i can't tell you how many times i <laughs> pondered quitting but <laughs> 
you know, I, I made I made some really good friendships in this industry. And every time it, it seems like every time I started trying, you know, even entertaining the idea of leaving, someone came up and said, man, you just got to stick it out. You just got to stick it out. But it mm-hmm. wasn't long. You know, it was three months into my my career at as an installer. I got promoted to lead tech. I had a, a supervisor that we really connected and uh, he he you know took that chance with me and made me a lead tech and it made me stand out a little bit um you know and i i did that for about two years and then you know back then i think now they're they're combination service techs and install techs so but mm-hmm. back then we were just install tech so i was a lead install tech and and it was a promotion to become a service tech so uh you know i went that route and i did the service tech thing for a couple of years and then and then um I, I got one of the managers I you might remember him, John, uh, Mark Schumacher. Oh yeah. Um, he was, he, he was, I was pretty close with him. He was real nice and we got along really well and super uh, nice guy. Yeah. So I, I had, uh, I'd actually gotten injured on the job. Um, and I, they put me up in the bench room with Rodney. Yeah. And, uh, we, uh, I, I, at that point I was working on amp modules and stuff like that and balancing them, you know, be able to send them back out in the field for these techs. These techs would bring them in and they need repair. Mm-hmm. We would repair them and send them back out. And that experience right there was enough to land me a spot. And as soon as I got, as soon as I got better, my knee was healed and I was uh, released to go back to work. Uh, Mark Schumacher said, well, you've got the experience now. Why don't, why don't you uh, apply for this maintenance tech position? And at the time, you basically had to wait for someone to retire to become a maintenance <laughs> tech. Right. Uh, people weren't, you know, hardly anybody was getting fired. Uh, in this case, we had a guy transfer to Hawaii, and yeah. that spot came up, and I got it. And so at, the, at that time, I was the youngest and the least experienced maintenance tech in <laughs> Austin. And so what was it like in the bench room, like learning all of the – the stuff that you needed to go out in the field as a maintenance tech, uh, from your background. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, crazy things going on in these, uh, active devices, these, uh, modules and, and all the electronics in there. Like how yeah. did you figure that out? And what was that experience like? I had a great teacher. Um, you know, I was in the, I was in the bench room for a total of maybe three months, but mm-hmm. in that three months, uh, you know, Ro- you know, Rodney, he's just the mm-hmm. most, one of the most patient guys and, and, uh, very smart he was he was there to you know basically lead me and and there was another guy in there named russell that mm-hmm. he uh he was real smart and he knew what he was doing and you know they they did put me on you know the, some of the easier tasks basically replacing uh you know the the actual uh amplifiers in the modules uh mm-hmm. was mostly what i was doing and then going through and balancing them out uh you know just turning little pots on these on these uh chips and putting them on an analyzer and Oh, it, that's pretty much it. Like, you know, yeah, that's all I did for three months, but, but, <laughs> but, you know, I didn't need to, I didn't really need to know how to solder in new MOSFETs and stuff like that in order to do, be a maintenance tech because maintenance techs aren't doing that. So mm-hmm. that, it, that, that's really, you know, it was the basics of what they were doing in the bench room, but it was the, it was, it carried over into a maintenance tech position. Um, and then, you know, playing in the cable games and stuff like that also, uh, you know, splicing, hardline cable putting on connectors and stuff like that that helped out quite a bit because we practiced and you know me and a couple other guys were always the top guys in the in the cable games the, uh, oh, yeah shameless plug in there days. for uh yeah. for sete and <laughs> yeah, sete no cable games put a plug in there for that <laughs> yeah no for doubt. anybody that anybody that hasn't been or hasn't done it i'd highly recommend it it's a great time totally Absolutely. agree that's one of my favorite parts of uh the SET events is uh, seeing the competition and especially, you know, in Austin when I, you know, where I'm from, where I know people that are competing and like, yeah, let's see who comes out on top here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's, it's always a lot of fun. Which is your favorite and what is your least favorite event in cable games? My favorite is, uh, hardline cable splicing or, mm-hmm. uh, put, you know, doing the connectors on hardline cable. That's it's that, I think that's probably the most competitive, uh the most competitive event 
you know, you got guys that I, I think they they don't allow it anymore. But you used to have guys that bring their own tools and stuff like oh, yeah. that. And <laughs> that was I think that was the most uh, competitive. So I had a lot of fun doing that, and and I was good at it. So I liked you know. Yeah, I liked that always winning. helps. <laughs> my least sense. favorite my least favorite event would have to be uh otdr <laughs> oh. I, I worked as a fiber splicer for f- six years and i know how to use an otdr and i don't know the the when you look at when you look at so many otdr shots throughout your career and then they put they put one in front of you that i would pass any single day you know and they tell you that mm-hmm. it's bad. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. And it, 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 I mean, <laughs> so, in the field and reality, that, that that's passing. But sure, in this yeah. little in this in a lab exercise setting. in the ballroom, you know, we can uh, exactly yeah, sure whatever, guys. Yeah. So uh, install tech to maintenance tech. What are what during that time or even after that in, in any of your time? Um, what are you know some of the leaps that you uh, that you saw? Because I'm sure you know that spans years. So what kind of yeah. You know, developing or emerging technology were you most impressed with, um, you know, during that time? A lot of it was, you know, the, the technology that was in the field didn't change a whole lot, except for, you know, um, at one point we launched uh, like a whole house DVR, which that was interesting. Um, a couple of years prior, I got, I got the opportunity when I was a lead tech, I got the opportunity to do a round table with uh, Glenn Britt, who was the CEO of Time Warner Cable mm-hmm. at the time. And, uh, Dish Network had just launched their Hopper DVR yeah. that w- allowed multi-room, you know, uh, uh, playback. And I asked, I kind of asked him what we're, what we had in store for the future, um, as far as multi-room DVR or whole house DVR, whatever you want to call it. They, uh, you know, what what we had in the in the books to, uh, you know, compete with that. And he kind of he. At the time, he just said, "Well, we have we have our start over feature, which is you know, people like that. So we're not doing whole <laughs> yeah. house." DVR. I was like, "Okay," <laughs> but it was about it was about two months later they announced we were launched in whole house DVR. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Um, so it might have been your question that prompted a much more uh, energetic response, right? I mean, two months I later, doubt it, but maybe <laughs> from he saying, "Oh, like- well, we got the start over feature and now." Boom! Here's whole home. Yeah, I like I'd like to th- I'd like to think I had a play in that, but probably not. Um, but like I said, the field the field stuff aside from set top boxes that didn't change a whole lot. You know, we, mm-hmm. with whole house DVR, we had to implement uh, um, the uh, POE point of entry filters and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, other than that, you know, I was I was a field tech when uh, um, Doxis 3.0 launched. And that was, again, that was, it was basically just hardware. Uh, I didn't, I didn't get on the, the head end side of, you know, the, the launch or anything like that, but it was, uh, I was there when that happened. And, the, but really the, the biggest leaps in technology are the, the tools that were provided to the techs to make their jobs, you know, easier. And I think it's kind of gone full circle, but when I first started as an install tech, we're using these old like huck meters that you know took 15 minutes to pull a return test um and then you know we we upgraded to the jdsu dsams um mm-hmm. which i think is viavi now right but yep um and even now they're you know they're these viavi meters that they're using now they're having to run these one checks and you know for every single job upload them into the onto onto a server for their management to see like i said i think it's kind of come full circle but now they're it, the jdsu dsams made our jobs a lot easier and now they're back to you know I, I see a lot of techs complaining about having to run these checks and upload them to a server and if they fail they they have to you know they have to stay and fix whatever the cause is um and yeah we we had you know when we, when i started we had the, the panasonic tough books which were you know pretty tough laptops but we had you know the these sprint wireless uh pci cards that oh yeah a lot of times you had to get a rubber band and and uh and you know these the, out in the field these these computers get a little beat up and you never get oh, yeah you never get one firsthand you get you know a hand-me-down from <laughs> someone else so Always. 
you get these tough books that have these PCI cards in them that you have to get a rubber band and strap around the, the card to have it at the right angle so that it would work. <laughs> Make a connection uh, inside yeah. there with the pins. Exactly. And then they upgraded those uh, after a while. We got new tough books and they got us these uh, – they basically had an integrated SIM card. Um, yeah. But they would only let us use 20, 20 gigs of data per month. So it, it always – never failed we have have to hit up the guy that's on vacation to go swap out sim cards because our sim card was out of data <laughs> wow that's nice. crazy well there's always a workaround right yeah absolutely so, so um from the time you started as an installer to i mean obviously you're pretty removed from that now but mm-hmm. um you know you talked about pulling return uh shots like what that's changed a lot right with how clean your upstream has to be yeah um yeah, so you know, back then we were only running one upstream frequency. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I think they're running some some areas are running sixteen. And wow. uh, yeah, so your your upstream signal to noise was you know, it had to be at least I don't know thirty four, thirty five, or else you know you'd get some some issues. But now mm-hmm. it's got to be like forty, thirty, thirty eight, thirty nine, forty. So is that what the guys are talking about when they're having to upload their uh, whole home check or whatever after they've completed an install and it fails? Is that one of the things you think they're having to go chase down as upstream or? No, I don't think so. For the most part, upstream upstream signal to noise has to be troubleshooted from the node. So that's that that fall, more so falls on a maintenance tech. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest, I don't really know. I, I like you said, I've been removed from the field for at least from the install and service side for uh for eight years yeah I, so in I, that I <laughs> yeah so in that time you did maintenance and then you went into the, the fiber side of things too right yeah so i was a fiber splicer for six years after maintenance um and that was yeah that's a whole nother animal you know going from but it was funny i, I would run into you know i'd be getting fuel in the gas station. I've got my, my truck and my fiber splicing trailer and a new, a new guy, an install guy or something would pull into the same gas station and be like, Hey man, how do you like maintenance? I'm like, I don't, dude, I don't do maintenance. He's like, well, what do you do? What do you do in that trailer? I'm like, I'm a fiber splicer. And they take them in there and show them around the trailer and show them kind of what we do. And it kind of blows their mind. You know, I remember being an install tech and never recognizing a fiber trailer or fiber truck mm-hmm. out in the field. And then, um, you know, just, I would, I would just assume they were maintenance and, you know, guy with a bucket truck is a maintenance guy, but, uh, we would, we would, uh, you know, as a, as an install tech, I didn't even know that fiber splicing was something we did. And, uh, after, after being in maintenance and seeing, you know, working with the fiber techs a little bit on node outages and stuff like that, it was something I got interested in. I made friends with a couple of the fiber guys just to put my name out there mm-hmm. and, uh, it paid off. I was I was in I think I was only in maintenance for about a year and a half, maybe two years mm-hmm. before before moving up to fiber. That's pretty cool to be able to show like if you had an installer and show them a fiber trailer and show them what you're doing when you're in that role and be like, hey, I started where you are. Look what you know, this is how yeah. cool the game can be if you put your head down. And yeah. And a lot of the, a lot of these new guys, they they see, you know, I know I know some installers that have been installer service techs for 20 years mm-hmm. and you know, they, they more so know the, the career path that you can take, but, um, a lot of these guys, they start out and they don't, they don't necessarily know all the different paths that, you know, an install position can, can lead to, you know, mm-hmm. a foot in the door, a foot in the door is it's worth a lot. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you need breaks and the right mentors in the right places, but it's also cool, you know, when you see, um, somebody that's in a leadership position in this industry, whether they're, you know, a COO um, or, you know, at any kind of leadership position and you're like, well, where did you start? And they're like, I started as an installer. Start yep. on the ground. Yep. Our, my VP, uh, he started as an installer and I mean, he's look where he is now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> VP, VP of, of uh, enterprise engineering. Yeah. That's pretty So did lot. you get, so did you go from, you know, you went from installer to maintenance tech to fiber slicer. Did you go from fiber slicing to where you're at now? I actually, um, in April of last year, yeah, April of 2019, I actually quit and left the company for six months. Okay. And uh, 
I uh, uh, the, this position I'm in now was created in that time. And uh, I had a friend get hired in as, you know, straight from a fiber splicer to the engineering side. And then the, the, a third position came open and I applied for it, interviewed and, and got it. Um, the position we're in now is, the, you know, they, they, they were looking for people with fiber experience because that's mm -hmm. a lot of what we're, we're dealing with, you know, with these 40 channel DWDM solutions. They want someone that had fiber background and, you know, someone that could speak the, the lingo with OSP and ISP. So what is, what, what's, what's the position called now and, and what is it uh, you do on a day-to-day on -day basis besides, so the, you know, in, 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 in or not interference, but uh, interfacing with the ISP, OSP engineering, everybody. Yeah. So we're infrastructure, infrastructure support engineers. Um, so we basically facilitate, uh, we, we kick off construction jobs uh, for that, that support the enterprise side. Uh, you know, we're deploying a lot of, uh, uh, like QFX routers and we need to, you know, get 40 gigs. So that's, you know, four DWDM channels, 10 gigs each to a, uh, to a hub site. So we facilitate, you know, deploying these 40 channel DWDM muxes between hubs. We do, I mean, there's, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you how much we do. We, we, <laughs> it would go on forever, but is this a, a charter specific kind of job um, uh, position or is that something you see throughout the cable industry? Um, I haven't really, my mom's been in, in not necessarily in the cable industry, but my mom was an infrastructure support engineer okay. for a company, but it, it was more of an IT side uh, thing that she was doing. As far as, as far as what we're doing, I'm not, I, I, I have no idea what Comcast is doing and when what uh Sunlink or, or what are they called now? LTS USA. Yeah, I I honestly don't know. <laughs> gotcha, I gotcha. Um, what you talked about? Uh, what is that Q something router? What? what yeah, is that? QFX. So that's a a, a a a we call it a CES, but it's basically uh -huh. a uh, we we have a an MX a Juniper mm -hmm. MX, and then yep. uh, that's the router, and then we actually put in these QFXs, which are switches. Gotcha. Um, they're 96 channel switches. Do you think that, um, that any, is there going to be virtualization that creeps into that eventually? Yeah, absolutely. Are you seeing any of that yet? A little bit. They're, they're doing, uh, we call it remote CES. So we'll put the, mm -hmm. an MX 480 in a primary hub and then, uh, pseudo wire over to a, uh, QFX stack, which is what, like I said, two ninety six port, uh, switches at another hub site but it's 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 being fed from the router back in another hub hmm, that's pretty cool yeah i mean that really doesn't that enable a lot more configurability remotely and and kind of on the fly yeah uh absolutely changes. yeah hmm. i'm not really on that side uh again like i said we we're we're focusing more on the on the osp and isp stuff right. rather than the the actual hardware but you know, we, we work with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sounds no, good. Well, hey, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to take a quick break and we will be, uh, we'll be right back and uh, maybe talk a little DAA and, and Doxus 4.0. You listen to Andy and John talk telecom. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, still have my, Matt Bonnie um, on the line and John, you wanted to ask him a question about uh, the industry in, in the future and where you see uh, yeah. where we're going. Well, yeah, I think one of our favorite things to do here is to kind of, Look at where you know we think we're going with uh, new technology and 5G and uh, Doxus 4.0, uh, 10G, the cable TV space. And uh, so yeah, I guess my question for you is, you know, you've had a pretty cool history and seen growth in a specific sector of the MSO world, but just generally speaking in the industry, um, we kind of see where, uh, like say Charter, Comcast, they're getting into mobile, and then you see. The mobile providers, the carriers getting into, uh, you know, home-based uh, fixed wireless. So where do you kind of see the convergence and what do you kind of expect in the next, you know, say five years uh, in this industry with all these technological uh, advancements uh, really reaching uh, kind of, I mean, it's really fever pitch at this point, it seems like. Yeah. 
Absolutely. You know, that like in, in the next five to 10 years, it's going to be interesting to see what really changes with, with the prevalence of, you know, services like Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video. And, and you know, there's, there's, I know there's more out there. Uh, rest in peace, Quibi. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's something, you know, I think that uh, cable providers are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to come up with something that's going to be competitive to those those other services and realistically you know streaming over the internet is is it's in my opinion it's just as good if not better than you know having a cable come out of the wall to a, a set top box and i think that's something you know it's in my in my opinion it's probably a more cost effective solution to move towards than you know the traditional set top box and stuff like that but um I, it's it's something's gonna have to happen and i've been saying that for a long time you know it's yeah, i don't want to yeah, say just, the industry's dying but it it's for 10 well, bucks a month you can have you know hulu and watch everything you can watch on you know my wife watches the bachelor or bachelorette <laughs> or whatever on hulu every every wednesday night and I don't know when the last time we turned on the cable box was. So that's true. And so as a person, I, I, you know, cut the cord, you know, a few years ago, I had um, sling TV first and that got, they raised their prices. Then I went to uh, Hulu TV and they started raising their prices. So I went to YouTube TV and then they raised their prices and I brought it back circle. Now I'm back with cable, a traditional cable provider, Yeah. but I don't, what, what has changed from now between, or between now and whenever I cut the cord four, five, six years ago is like you said, I don't have a set top box. All I do is stream uh, and it's Comcast in my area. I stream from my phone straight to uh, my TV. Uh, mm -hmm. No need for, like you said, cable out of the wall, no need for a set top box. And the quality is for the first five to 10 seconds. Yeah. It's a little fuzzy, but you know, then after it buffers and it kicks in, I have what I would think is the, at least um, uh, the same quality of picture as i would with a with a, a fixed uh with you know line uh coming yeah. out of the wall going to the set top box so uh, i mean it's it you know you said the cable industry it kind of might seem like it's dying but i think people are going to keep circling back around um and, and come back to cable because you know you can only get some shows on hulu and only some shows on netflix and now you know comcast nbc has peacock and you can only get like parks and rec i love parks and rec it used to be on yeah. netflix had no problem now it's on Peacock only. And so you're seeing, you're getting all of these companies, you know, getting greedy and only allowing their shows on their platform. And at some point you're going to, at least I think people are going to be like me and be like, forget it. I'm just going to go back to cable. It, at this point, it costs the same after all these price raises. And, you know, I, I can get live TV and my live sports and all that stuff. And um, yeah. but, I but think can you get Mandalorian back. on, on Peacock? No, so there's only certain. I mean, See, yes, that's there's certain have to apps get. that you need. <laughs> but you know, I, um, you know, Netflix, you can share with a family member, and you know, some of the costs. Disney Plus, same thing. You know, five bucks a month, and you know, a few people in your family use it, and and you get to go. But um, for me, my biggest thing, and I think a lot of what drives cable and TV is is live sports, and you can't get that. Um, you've got to pay for it, whether that's YouTube TV, whether that's Hulu TV, Sling TV, or a traditional cable provider. And right now, all those prices are generally the same. So um, yeah. I might but, as well you know, package my TV and my internet and have one bill instead of four different bills. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I've got Spectrum at my house. We've got, we've got cable boxes and all that, but you know, for sports and stuff, I, I, I use the Spectrum app and, um, you know, I stream it on my computer. I could watch live football through the Spectrum app without a set top box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it, a lot of smart TVs and, you know, I think, I think now you can get the spectrum app on the Xbox. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get it on the PlayStation uh, five and the, the new Xbox and all that. You can get it on a Roku. Um, I, I don't know if you can get it on an Apple TV still or not. I think you can, but for a while there, it wasn't available on Apple TV, but all these, all these, you know, third party devices are, are supporting the app now. And yeah. I, I think I honestly, that's, that's, if, if I were running the company, that's the direction I would go is, is, you know, getting app support on, on whatever device people are using and, and, you know, well, the point, thing you know, cable boxes yeah, aren't cheap. 
yeah, <laughs> well they're, they're really not you know you can get rid of that because they're clunky and and it's just it's inventory you've got to, there's a lot of touches they've got to get refurbished there's just a lot that goes with that um and i mean you know even every single one they send you if you do a self-install kit or a modem you get uh they send you a uh a uh, coax jumper for it yeah. and some i mean you know there's a cost of so maybe even an hdmi cable i don't know yeah i mean yeah. and they're cheap you know uh but i mean still every single one of them goes out the door with one of those and and so there's a cost associated with that but the other thing too in my mind is that stuff is you know delivered over the top over the so it's not um taking up any uh any of your spectrum. So if you could get away from move to an IPTV solution yeah. or move people over to an app, then you can kind of clear out that spectrum and stop having to deliver video um, in your um, uh, in your coax spectrum or in your and then you can open that up for more Doxis channels and exactly. and get more uh, move further down the road toward that 10G goal of yeah. full duplex. Absolutely. But um, you know that's 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 my opinion on the video the video side as far as you know and that that does tie into the the internet side too like you said get rid of if you can clear up the spectrum from you know and make more room for doxis channels i i would imagine that's the direction that will go and i think it'll have to go that way in five to ten years especially with every company is you know every year every other year whatever they're they're offering the next best thing and everyone else has to compete with that Mm -hmm. so yeah, and I've you know one of the things that was going to happen anyway, and I think has kind of happened even more is that more demand on the upstream and moving the split um, up into the 185 or or 200 plus or whatever wherever that is. So tra- doing all that mid split uh, transition is going to be huge, and you need more spectrum for that. So the more yeah. that you can free up with uh, by moving away from traditional video. Uh, you know, channels than video qualms, then that will really make that possible. Yeah. And, you know, there's also the fact of if you want, you know, five cable boxes in your house, you're paying for, you know, a lease on five different cable boxes. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, you're, you know, drilling holes in your walls and, and running cable on the outside of your house. In my opinion, I don't, I don't like the look of that. So, I no, just, you know, I don't think a lot of people do. You know, I, I, <laughs> I didn't want to have holes drilled in my house whenever, you know, I had the cable installed. So I, I, right. arranged, I arranged my house to be able to utilize the existing outlets that we had, but a lot of people don't do that. And a lot of, you know, a lot of these, a lot of older houses don't have cable outlets and stuff like that. So it's, Oh again, man. Are you on that uh, Facebook group? Uh, like the cable, uh, cable gods or any of those other uh, Facebook yeah. groups? I I'm saw one the other day there's so many great installs that get posted on there. There was one where somebody, the installer actually like drilled a hole through the window frame and like brought the cable right through the window frame and then down the inside wall of the house. Nice. And it said customer didn't want a hole in the wall. Yeah. Hey, didn't give him a hole in the wall. He, oh, he, he right. just did what he just, just did. Drill a hole right through the edge of the window frame and just right through there. Yeah. Like, wow. you know, when I was an installer, when you know, there was a few, the few areas where I worked where we, you know, it was brand new neighborhoods with brand new houses. And you see that all the time where people are like, mm-hmm. oh, you have to drill through my wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're going to run mm-hmm. that through the outside of the house. Yeah. You know, or we, you know, get up in the attic and charge them a hundred bucks to do a wall drop. It's, you know, people don't. It, yeah, it, people don't want that. Yeah. I, I go up in my attic and I just see just the amount of cables up there that are cut. And hanging from you know the the rafters, it, it, it I go up there and I start getting anxiety. It, it I just want I need to get up there and just clear it all out. But it's just you know thirty plus years of of you know it will it was because um, this used to be a uh, uh, a Time Warner uh, system and then you know Comcast bought it, so you know I'm sure they came in and they did their own thing and then Direct yeah. TV, someone got Direct TV years ago and they you know had their own wiring and it's like you said it's just a mess. But even with the streaming, you know, you sc- if we're going towards streaming from an app or streaming from, uh, you know, an Xbox or PlayStation, and you just use the app there, you're still going to need, you know, um, cables, cords, wires going to the house, you know, bringing your internet. So, you know, we see right. now either fiber to the home, we see HFC, um, you know, where do you see, um, you know, the, 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 
the the cabling going to the home going is is it all going to be fiber to the home or are we okay with hfc now that we're getting more out of it with you know doxis doxis 4.0 and we're able to squeeze more and more out of that coax um you know at, at what point do you think you know okay this is this is all we can get out of it, it you know everything's got to be fiber now yeah i i think you know we're deploying fiber to the home in some areas and i think i i again i think you can get about the same you know you can get any anything you really need out of coax uh you know for for a, a residential service standpoint you know when you get in a when you get in a commercial stuff where you're needing you know 10 gigs or something like that yeah fiber is is absolutely necessary but for fiber to the home it's it's expensive to build out you know mm -hmm. you're over it it only really makes sense to build it in uh in greenfield areas um doing like a brownfield type build on that it's not really cost effective but sure um as far as like wiring in the home you know once with fiber to the home you're you're running a fiber drop to an rfog node in a house box you know on the side of the house and then it's it's going coax from there anyways so mm -hmm. the 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 only thing i've seen one system and I can't even remember where it was, but it was, they had, they had OLTs, uh, you know, mm -hmm. where they, they basically run fiber all the way to a modem. Hmm. And that is really, you know, I think that's, if, if fiber to the home is the direction we go, that's the, that's the, the direction we need to be looking towards is, is installing OLTs in the home with fiber, you know, coming straight to them. Is that not a little bit uh, overkill, though? I mean, at what as a, a normal residential user, <laughs> do you do you need fiber straight to your modem, like injected right into my veins? It's a little probably not. It's it's overkill again. Yeah, I think for a commercial standpoint, it, it's necessary in a lot of applications, but for sure. residentials, yeah. I don't think so. It just sounds good. It, it sounds yeah. good for the marketing team to, to exactly. hey, we got fiber directly to your home, you know, and it's uh, hey, if it sells, it sells. Yep, but. So, uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, you know, talking about New Braunfels a little bit, one of my favorite places in Texas and if not even the whole U.S., um, you're doing a little fly fishing down there. Uh, you Absolutely. know, people probably think of Montana or somewhere else when they think of fly fishing, but we've got a little bit of a fly fishing scene going on in Texas. So, uh, how did you get into that and, and like, what is that like down there? Um, the fly fishing, you know, people come from all over the state to come fly fish in New Braunfels. There's, there's only a, a handful of rivers that, you know, obviously trout aren't native in Texas, except for up in the Davis mountains, I think it is, or not, uh, the Guadalupe mountains out mm -hmm. in West Texas, uh, pretty much the only area where there's native trout, but New Braunfels, the Guadalupe river here in New Braunfels, they stock the trout, uh, in the river and they stock more trout in this river every year than any other location in texas so the it's a tailwater from you know canyon lake we get uh we the, the water comes from like 200 feet down and it's uh it's it's cold enough to maintain the trout during the winter months so they'll start stocking next month uh actually in a couple weeks here they'll start stocking the river up and they'll run that through about march but uh i got into it i i i don't even remember being like I've, I've been a tournament bass fisher you know since i was like 16 so it's i've i've always loved bass fishing um i'd never fly fished and then for some reason i told my wife i wanted to get into fly fishing and then for my birthday two or three years ago she got me a fly rod and reel for my birthday and you know i i went out and tried it sucked I didn't know what I was doing. I, the, the guy that owns the fly shop in Canyon Lake that I'm pretty good friends with now, he, uh, I went out there and he, he kind of showed me the ropes and, um, now, you know, in the out, outside of, outside of the, the stocking months here in Texas, me and my wife like to make trips. We just got back from Arkansas for, uh, we, we spent a week in Heber Springs on the little red river fly fishing, went out with two different guides and, uh, you know, it had a blast. It was, it was awesome, but. So she's into it too. You got her into it. Yeah. So actually nice. this trip to Arkansas, it was her first time fly fishing and she did okay. great. She did really well. She, uh, she picked it up. You know, I, I, I went out the day before we had our guided trip. I took her out down to the water and, you know, let her, let her throw the rod around a little bit. And, um, 
she was kind of getting it, but she was getting frustrated with me because I, I didn't know, you know, I'm not the best teacher when it comes to anything. <laughs> but um, she, uh, you know, the, we went out there with the guide and he was showing her all the same things I was showing her, but he had all, he had these different terminologies and stuff like that that he was using that made it make a lot more sense to her. Uh, but she picked it up. She she caught the first like six fish. There you wow, go. That's, nice. that's the way to get her invested and keep wanting to go back. Is uh, yeah. I don't know if you did that on purpose and weren't catching stuff on purpose, but well done there. <laughs> I was yeah. trying, I'm sure. But um, where is uh, where is Heber Springs? Is that Northwest Arkansas? It's actually like central, north central Arkansas. It's uh, um, about an hour north of uh, Little Rock. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, a cool little place. Um, no, little Arkansas is an interesting place. You know, for a lot of my career, I would uh, drive through and deal with stuff in southern Arkansas. And just driving through on I-40, I was like, man, Arkansas is not that impressive. And then once I discover northwest Arkansas, a northern part of Arkansas, I'm like, yeah, man, that is a beautiful state. In fact, yeah. this sh- shirt is from Fayette Chill, which is a brand out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And uh, that's a cool spot okay. up there, man. Yeah. Um, you know, we just bought a Forerunner with, you know, we bought a, a TRD off road premium. Yeah. You know, it's good four wheel drive with the locking differential and the, you know, crawler mode and all that stuff. So we're one of the trips where I'm, I don't know if my wife's planning on going with me, but I'm planning on going up to the Wachita <laughs> Mountains up there in Northwest Arkansas and spending a few days on the trails and the Forerunner out there. Oh, that would be nice. killer. Nice. Well, hopefully, so, maybe I can get my Jeep done by then. I'll come uh, join you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Pull me out. <laughs> <laughs> you fly fish, John? You, you uh, gotta, you no, gotta I have. Uh, I am gonna have to up my game. It's been on my radar for quite some time, but uh, I've been, uh, you know, bass fisherman for many years. But yeah, I went to the um, fly fishing store and looked at some of the gear, and I was like, "Wow, this looks awesome." Uh, it is significantly more expensive than yeah. bass fishing gear. <laughs> it is. Um, you can get a good rod and reel set up for not too expensive, but um, I was looking at, so I took my rod and reel down to uh, the Gulf Coast. We went to uh, Port Mansfield back in July and I took my rod and reel down there, but I, you know, I was kind of, I didn't want to get it super wet and all that stuff. And also I didn't want to break it on a big old redfish or something. So <laughs> I was kind of taking it easy. And when we got back, I started looking at the saltwater fly fishing stuff and that stuff is no joke expensive. Yeah. Like, minimum 1200 bucks for a reel mm. That's insane. i think you can spend as much as you want on pretty much any sporting goods you know and yeah. especially the fishing stuff but i guess nothing that i've ever seen uh really blew my mind as much as the stuff for offshore fishing like one of those huge reels with yeah. the counters digital counters on them and it's brass and like 25 grand yeah it's like whoa electric winch on it and all that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's my my I, I tried out fly fishing when I was in college and I went on a, a couple trips and I could just not get it down. I will just I will stick to bass fishing. I, it was and I know like you said, Matt, you gotta stick with it and it will yeah. get better. And but I just I could not I did not have the patience for that. And I was like, you know, fishing requires enough patience as it is. Fly fishing, I think, requires a whole nother level of patience. That I, I just I just don't have so my, my hat's off to you for for sticking with it and uh, it. making it a hobby. Yeah, it's great, and it's it, what's interesting. So we we fly fish in the Vail Valley in Colorado. Uh, we've done nice. that twice now. Uh, we were typically in October is when we go to Colorado. We had our trip to Arkansas scheduled for June, uh, but with the COVID and everything, we we ended up having to cancel back in June and move it out to uh, October. So we didn't make it out to Colorado this year, but fishing the rivers in Colorado is like, you know, it's completely different from fishing the river here in New Braunfels, which is completely different from fishing the little red river in Arkansas. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the rivers in Colorado, depending on when you go, you're either, you're you're having to deal with either the runoff, which is, you know, all the snow melting. And then you, you Mm -hmm. know, that's usually about early summer starting, you know, mid June or so. And then the the rivers down there turn into whitewater rafting rivers. Uh, but you know, in October, everything's starting to freeze up in the mountains and stuff like that. And the water is pretty shallow. There's ice shelf, you know, forming along <laughs> riverbank and stuff like that. And the water is only like, you know, a foot and a half deep. So you're, you're spotting these fish and you're trying to stay behind a tree or something to, you know, so they can't see you. That's pretty cool. You know, one thing I really enjoy whenever we've had guests on is, um, people that I know, 
pretty well. And then we have you fill out the bio, and then there's things I learned about you that I didn't know before. You said the Vale or River Valley is your favorite uh, vacation spot. So, uh, what else? What else is going on out there uh, when you're you know not in the river? Um, well, not much. The <laughs> restaurants aren't good. I don't know if you've, you've been to Colorado. They don't have good uh-huh. food in Colorado. <laughs> um, just, that's just a damnation of Colorado, right? There. Yeah, yeah. We, we what we typically do is uh, uh, we we go to the grocery store and stock up on food and cook. You know, we cook for ourselves and stuff like that. We're not trying to go out and eat. And you get an Airbnb like, or is that the best solution out there or yeah so we the uh three years ago we stayed in an airbnb in uh in vale on the on the vale golf course i can't remember what the golf course is called but it, it was right on the golf course it was this huge house and it was just me and my wife but uh it was this huge house and there's a little downstairs apartment and the guy that that managed it he didn't own the place but he, he got to live there for free for managing the airbnb um and he was super nice you know let me borrow some of his fishing stuff um hiking is a big thing you know i love mm-hmm. hiking but for the most part fishing hiking um even some of the off-road trails up there are really good there's there's a it's pretty interesting when you get off of the interstate which is out there in the Vale valley it's interstate 70 it goes uh all the way you know i think it goes all the way into oklahoma oklahoma city but uh <laughs> and probably beyond that but anyway um once you get off interstate 70 going towards some of these reservoirs and stuff like that, that are just tucked away in the mountains. It's, it's these dirt roads that you're on for, you know, 20, 30 miles. And, uh, you don't see a single other person out there. It's, it's sounds good like place. You. It's yeah. It's just a great place to, you know, just get some, to, to get away from the, the bustling, you know, working in Austin, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's just a nice retreat to just get away from people. And now we, we actually got a timeshare out there. So we're, Awesome. uh yeah we we have a uh it's with the weston so we could stay at the the weston resort out there at beaver beaver creek in avon which is about Sweet. 15 miles west of vale nice that whole, yeah. that whole valley is just beautiful plus you know yeah. i'm a big fan of bears i've got a lot of bear knickknacks and stuff uh-huh. everywhere <laughs> and uh nice. Yeah, you know, the chance of seeing a bear out there is very real. So, so have you seen one fun. yet, or you're still you're still searching for your first one? Still searching. I've It'll seen come. bears before. I've I've been I've uh, you know grew up in Bakersfield, California, but uh, we used to go camping in Northern California in the Shasta region, and uh, I've seen bears out there while you know out deer hunting and stuff up there. So Shasta re- region is great. I went fishing up there and I caught some rainbow trout, and that was one of the coolest things i've ever seen is a, is a rainbow trout so i was pretty yeah pretty stoked about that i think it was a shaft you ever region. been been uh closer than you'd like to a bear yes once we were out we were out deer hunting and uh it was me and my me and my childhood best friend and his dad and uh we're walking around we're walking out on this uh uh you know they, out there in the mountains they, they build these fire roads to make like a fire break in the mountains mm-hmm. so uh we're walking down this fire road and we're about i don't know three four miles from the truck and sun starts sun starting to go down and and it was actually a cub that came out you know he he came walking out about 15 feet in front of us and Ooh, wow. my buddy's dad was like okay he, you know he carried a revolver on him a big <laughs> 357 revolver but he's like walk backwards don't run <laughs> You know, he, he knew he's like that. The, the mother bears somewhere nearby. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. He's not wandering like, cool. off too far. Yeah. From home. He's like, we're just going to be a little quiet until we know where this bear is. And, and the mother bear was actually about a hundred yards away. Wow. Mm. So it wasn't too close, but it was. They, they can close real. that ground quickly. It was real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, Hey, we will, uh, Matt, we appreciate the time and, uh, sincerely it's, uh, you spent, spent a long time with us this morning. So thank you for that. Um, we, we will get you out of here on this. It is October 31st today. It is Halloween. Are you a lights on or lights off, you know, kind of hide from the kids kind of guy. Um, typically we're lights on. Uh, I don't know about this year. We haven't decided yet if we need, we, we've got some candy, but, uh, I don't know. I think we'll probably turn the lights on, pass out some candy, or maybe just set the bucket on the porch and let them have a free like for all. I've got, well, I've got a long pole. First kid just takes basket. the whole bucket with him. 
That's fine. Oh, a hundred percent. I don't care. <laughs> you tried, right? You tried to yeah. hand out candy. So yeah. Well, good. Well, hey, enjoy the rest of your Halloween day. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we will. Uh, we'll talk soon. We'll see you around. Great. Thank you, guys. Later, Matt. All right, Thanks, later, man. Matt. All right, John, we have reached the end of this episode. I am glad that you were here uh, with me going through it. I'm glad our listeners were here and have uh, stuck around thus far. Uh, as always, subscribe to us on Apple iTunes, or sorry, on Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, Amazon Music, uh, however you are on YouTube, however you want to consume our content. We appreciate it, and we want you to subscribe. So, John... With that being said, that is all I have for today. Enjoy the rest of your Halloween. And um, yeah, I can't wait to talk to you again, man. Yeah, it's been a good one, y'all. Thanks for uh, tuning in, people, and spread the word. Uh, I am very uh, flattered to hear an increasing number of my peeps say, hey, I found your podcast. I don't know if they listened to it, but they said they found it and they thought it was cool. So <laughs> Hey, we're, uh, we're still anyway. doing our Chick-fil-A giveaway. So, uh, you know, um, subscribe or... Uh, Follow us on Twitter or um, on Facebook, and uh, you could be part of that giveaway and win a Chick-fil-A gift card. What is that uh, Twitter account? The Twitter is at A-A-J-T-T podcast, at Alpha Alpha Juliet Tango Tango podcast. And the Facebook, just search for Andy, Ampersand, John, Talk Telecom. That's right. It is updated daily. And when I say daily, that is a complete lie. Um, because, uh, <laughs> But uh, it is there. And um, hit it up and like it and share it. And uh, let us know what you think. Um, and last but not least, this is coming out uh, the day before Election Day. So whatever your uh, you know party affiliation, whatever your political leanings are, go out and vote. Um, because that's uh, one of the few ways that you have a say in... Uh, and how this country is run. And I do not want to hear anybody complain about it. If you did not vote, I don't want to hear you complain about, uh, about you know, whichever one. Can't you complain guess. if you don't vote. You know, exactly. it's good to see the reports of uh, record turnout. So crazy, right? People engaged. I mean, well, we've been griping for so many years about how few people vote. And yep. so uh, for whatever reason, people are engaged now. And, and that's should be a good thing. Um, I already voted. I early voted. Uh, which Same. I seldom do. Um, I will say that there's definitely some benefits to early voting, uh, at least in Austin, Texas, there are, because there is a multitude of places that are giving you some free things <laughs> or discounts if you show up with an I voted sticker. So, um, yeah, I'm just, glad you took advantage. Oh, yeah. I got a free piece of pizza at Home Slice. I uh, got a free margarita at um, uh, some other little restaurant and I got a free cookie at uh, Easy Tire. So. Um, there was a couple I didn't take advantage of. Uh, some little place that they would give you. There's a place that sells desk plants. Oh, okay. Um, and you get a free two inch succulent. I didn't make it over there. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, in four years. Give, give it another yeah. four years and you can get your free free desk plant. <laughs> well, with that being said, anyway, that, that's all I got. <laughs> that wraps it up for us today. Go enjoy uh, your weeks. Go vote. And uh, we will talk to you soon. You're now logging off. Andy and John talk telecom. Peace out.